I'm very happy to present this work entitled Inequality and Household Adaptation to Schooling Shocks, COVID-Induced Online Learning Engagement in Real Time. This is joint work with uh, two of my former doctoral students, Andrew Bacher hicks who has now joined me at Boston University's Wheelock College of Education, uh, and Christine Mulhern, uh, who uh, is at Harvard and is uh, soon transitioning to a job at RAND. Uh, the background for this paper, I'll talk about the research background for a second, uh, but let me just start with a personal uh, anecdote, which is that when the COVID pandemic started to shut down American schools in the spring of this past year, in March of 2020, uh, my wife and I scrambled to think about how are we going to uh, help our three elementary school aged children uh, deal with the fact that they no longer have in-person schooling. Uh, and this partly prompted me to think about more broadly, I know what we are doing, we are scrambling and looking on the internet for all kinds of resources, whether it's math worksheets or interesting apps or, or websites to engage our children. But it prompted me uh, and my co-authors to think about broadly, can we say anything about what parents across the US are doing in response to the shock of these school closures? Uh, there are 55 million students in the US that uh, lost their schooling, their in-person schooling, uh, nearly simultaneously. Almost all, all schools began to do some form of virtual education, though the quality and extent of that varied quite dramatically, depending on where students were enrolled. Uh, and it raised huge questions and concerns about the learning effects of this shift to, to, to remote instruction. And in particular, a lot of concerns um, about the digital divide uh, which includes things like access to the internet and to computers, access to schools that are effectively using that kind of remote instruction, uh, but also um, in some sense differences in parents' own capacity, uh, preferences, willingness to and, and constraints in time and money in terms of their own ability to engage with uh, supporting their children. And uh, these issues aren't aren't just limited to the spring of 2020. Most schools or many schools in the US remain virtual this fall. And so we're hoping that this work is going to help answer the question, how are households, how are families dealing with the shock of not having in-person schooling? And how are they perhaps compensating for that lack of, of schooling? And so the key research questions we're gonna ask in this paper are, how did US households and indirectly schools, and we'll talk about that in a second, how did they adapt to widespread school closures in response to the COVID pandemic? And to what extent do households responses to those school closures differ by socioeconomic status as well as other dimensions that we can measure? So where are we gonna get our data from? The, the main uh, data source we're gonna use is uh, Google Trends. So Google makes publicly available measures of what they call search intensity for any search term you can type into their uh, website. And what search intensity means is they will let you, they will tell you what fraction of searches in a given area were devoted to that particular term on a given day. And they normalize it in a way that I don't wanna get into, we get into it in the paper, uh, but the point is we can say something about the extent to which a given search term is uh, popular or being searched for intensely or not at a given time period. And this data is available uh, uh, over time by week uh, and also the finest geographic level by groups of counties called designated market areas or DMAs. So these are you know two, three, four counties at a time. And so we're going to collect weekly search data for about the last five years and we collected it for uh, dozens of search terms. We basically made a long list of all the kinds of terms we could think of that people might associate with uh, online learning. Uh, and that's the, that's the outcome data we're going to look at. We also attach to that data on uh, characteristics of these DMAs, these geographies that we're able to observe. In other words, is this group of counties uh, a high or a low income one? What fraction of adults have a BA? How many people in that area have broadband access or a computer? Computer. Uh, and we also took, so we got that from the US Census, from the American Community Survey. And we also used the Stanford Education Data Archive to characterize something about the student population and the, the schools in that area. And let me just say, I'll, I'll give you an example that this, this figure on the right shows that in uh, March of 2020, there was a sudden and dramatic spike in the search intensity for a simple term like online learning. And that's a great example of how, um, what we're gonna be looking at. So let me walk you through four things that we found. Uh, the first finding, which was really striking to us, was we uh, 
we had this long list of uh, potential search terms, and it turns out they sorted into two relatively neat bins. One we called school-centered resources, which tended to be branded searches. The, by far the most common was Google searching for Google Classroom, and Google Classroom we call a school-centered resource because a parent on their own is not going to be using Google Classroom. It's something that a school has to subscribe to and then use as the platform for interacting with students. So Google Classroom was by far the most popular search term, but also terms like Khan Academy and other sort of apps or websites or platforms that schools use to interact with students remotely, uh, school, school, Schoology, Class Dojo, Flipgrid, those kind of things. We put in the school-centered resources bin. And then we had another set of search terms which were more generic terms that we deemed parent-centered resources, which seemed like a parent simply trying to find generic uh, uh, learning support for their child, maybe independently of their school. Things like math worksheets or online classes or online school, for example. And so our first finding was that searches for these school-centered resources, these sort of branded things, these platforms that schools are using, substantially uh, outnumber the searches for uh, these parent-centered resources. So that was already one interesting finding. Uh, which suggests that schools were using these platforms and that parents were searching for how to access what the schools were asking them to access. Finding two was that uh, both school searches for school-centered resources and parent-centered resources track the school calendar in a, in a not terribly surprising way. So I've graphed here for you the logarithm of this search intensity so that changes can be interpreted roughly as percentage changes in the intensity over time relative to March 1st, 2020. And what you can see is that searches for school-centered resources tend to be highest at the beginning of September, which is when most schools are coming back online and, and parents are beginning to uh, and students are beginning to understand what the school is asking them to do. And then they tend to drop off as the school year goes on, and then they plummet to, to basically zero during the summertime. You see a, a fairly similar pattern with parent-centered resources. People are looking for math worksheets and other such resources throughout the school year. That also plummets during the summer. That pattern repeats itself year after year in our data, and the, except in the spring of 20. 2020 when you see this massive and uncharacteristic spike in searches both for school-centered and parent-centered resources. And so that seems immediately some indication that COVID really changed the, the typical pattern, the typical internet search behavior of households uh, relative to previous springs. The third finding is that these searches for online learning resources, the intensity uh, to which they, those, those spikes in the spring of 2020 happened, varied pretty substantially by geography. And so what we've done here is we've mapped these designated market areas, which are, as I said, groups of counties. And you can see that uh, these darker areas are places where search for these online learning resources spiked particularly high. So the Northeast, uh, the West Coast, uh, it looks like Texas as well, a bit in Florida. And then there are, the lighter colored areas are places where search for those online learning resource did, resources did not spike so much. And we show this both to give you a sense of what the level of geography we're dealing with is, but also because we're then going to connect those geographies to things like income, parental education, technological access, racial composition of the student bodies, and ask whether there's any correlation between the patterns you're seeing here geographically and the socioeconomic and other makeup of those areas. And so finding four is, in fact, that there is a substantial relationship between the extent to which search for online learning resources increased and the demographic and socioeconomic composition of an area. And so what we've shown you here are coefficients from basically a very simple difference in different specification, where we're asking how search intensity for various online learning resources changed post-COVID, where zero on our uh, horizontal axis represents March 1st, which is roughly when news of COVID began to spread. We're asking how search behavior changed between high SES areas and low SES areas, where socioeconomic status SES is defined as a basically a combination of income, education levels, and technological access as measured by the uh, U.S. Census. And so what these coefficients tell you in both of these graphs is that prior to the advent of COVID, search behavior for these terms was actually relatively similar across areas with different SES status, which is already somewhat interesting, but that when COVID hit, the extent to which search for online learning resources spiked was much higher in the high socioeconomic status, the high income 
areas relative to the lower income areas. And in fact, um, uh, though it's a little hard to interpret these coefficients without uh, some broader information we provide in the paper, basically what it means is that in high socioeconomic status areas, it's search intensity for these online learning resources doubled, the, or rather the, the change was twice as high as it was in the low socioeconomic status areas. In other words, it looks like uh, gaps are opening up by income and, edu and parental education level in the extent to which households are attempting to compensate for this lost instructional time by seeking out resources either that are related to the school, uh, resources being provided by the school through things like Google Classroom, uh, or th things that the parents are trying to provide themselves like math worksheets. Um, and I will say that regardless of whether you characterize uh, these geographies, these designated market areas by this broad measure of socioeconomic status or by income alone or by access to internet and home computers or by rurality or by the racial composition uh, of students in the area, you get similar messages uh, that, that gaps are opening up by all of these measures of um, uh, sort of economic access and advantage. And so what do we, what do we conclude? What do we think all this means? So uh, I think the, the first sort of innovation of this paper is just to realize that this household adaptation to these kind of major shocks to the schooling system can be observed using internet search data. Um, that internet search data has been used for other things, but we think this is a, a nice application of that. Uh, we can show that these school closures induced households to seek ways to compensate for lost in-person instruction. Uh, and that importantly, and, and, and you know, in a way that poses a real challenge for, for thinking about uh, educational equality, there are obvious and, and large socioeconomic differences in the way and the extent to which households are engaging in this compensatory behavior. Some of which is probably driven by parents and some of which may be driven by the what the schools themselves are asking parents and students to do. And so it highlights a new aspect of the digital divide that I think hasn't been um, previously appreciated. Uh, we also point out that, that this is data that's available in real time. You can see it week by week. We stopped the data collection at the end of May, but we could uh, update it soon to see what's now happening in the fall now, right? Uh, we can update this analysis to ask now that schools are reopening or not reopening, what does that mean? Uh, for these kind of gaps. Uh, and this is analysis that can be done in other countries as well. Google Trends makes this data available, uh, not just in the United States. Um, I think more broadly, inequality in access to and use of these earn online learning resources during the COVID pandemic almost certainly are going to widen learning gaps, knowledge gaps. And they point to one potential mechanism that explains recent evidence of those widened gaps. We actually don't have a lot of direct evidence about learning outcomes at this point. Uh, the Opportunity Insights team has provided some of that evidence from the uh, online uh, platform Zern, which is a math learning platform, which seems to suggest that there are widening learning gaps by uh, student socioeconomic background. And our work provides one potential mechanism that, that there are differences in households behavior with respect to pursuing these uh, compensatory mechanisms. Uh, and then, you know, thinking about potential policy responses, um, uh, it, this may, this certainly is strongly suggested that students in low socioeconomic uh, status areas and rural communities are likely going to need additional support in the coming year, whether that's about providing better internet access, better access to home computers, uh, schools that, that provide better online learning uh, platforms and interaction, uh, educating parents about how to look for these resources. It's not clear that our work can quite distinguish those facts, but it all suggests that, that there are going to be inequalities that uh, have, if anything, increased. And we think that improving engagement with online learning is likely going to be key to equalizing learning opportunities and preventing even further widening of these knowledge gaps during the pandemic, particularly given that it looks like remote instruction is here to stay uh, for at least a few months, and my guess is for uh, uh, much of the coming school year. So we're, we're grateful for the opportunity to uh, present this research and we hope that this can spark future conversations and research about how households uh, in some sense privately react to the loss of uh, important public services.